Hi friends, here we are, our last lesson in Philippians, and it's been a wonderful nine weeks. I pray that you've been blessed as you've gotten into God's Word, and I know God's Word has gotten into you because you've been memorizing it, and I'm so proud of you. So we're going to look at our last lesson today and see what God has to say. He's still speaking, so let's pray. Father, I thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. Lord, I thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your goodness, your faithfulness. Lord, I ask now the Holy Spirit would open the eyes of our understanding. Lord, fill us afresh with the Spirit as we sit at your feet. Teach us for your namesake. In Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, chapter four starts out with a therefore. So as you all students of the word know, we have to ask what the therefore is. Therefore, right. And this refers back to chapter three, which we've talked about in depth. And Paul here is talking, or in chapter three, was talking about the believer's glorious hope and their earnest expectation of eternal life. And so he's going to roll right into chapter four. And he says in verse one, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and my crown. So stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Stand fast in the Lord, not in your leaders, not in your pastor, in the Lord, beloved. And we continue to see Paul's love just poured out through his writing throughout this entire epistle. And he doesn't stop. And so verse two, he says, I implore these two women, my friends here, to be of the same mind in the Lord. No, I'm not going to try to pronounce the names. It doesn't matter. <laughs> there were two women who worked with Paul and were having some kind of disagreement. Now, I think it's super cool that we don't know what was wrong. And it's interesting that Paul never takes sides which kind of indicates to me we're not dealing with a sin issue here. Now, Paul loved these women. He had served with these women. And despite the fact we don't know what the issue was, we know what the answer is. And the answer was to be of the same mind in the Lord. That's what Paul wanted them to do. Now, they, when they both had that same mind, the mind of Christ, when they were appropriating the mind of Christ, there would be no personality preferences that would trump biblical standards. Um, small differences in ministry methodology would cease to exist. Things that weren't sin wouldn't be treated like sin. And Paul knew that when they were of the same mind in the Lord, there would be unity through humility. And we looked at that in depth in chapter 2 when we talk about how Jesus humbled himself and came to the earth. Go back and read that section, verses 5 through 8. So Paul says, be of the same mind in the Lord. And then in verse 10, he says, I urge you also, true companion, help these women. Help these women? <laughs> Interesting. How do you sometimes help two women who are disputing? Okay, well, I just... It doesn't really tell us, but I can imagine the first thing would be to pray for them and then to remind them of the, the, their fellowship in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remind them of the people that need to know the gospel. Remind them of who they are in Christ. Put their minds on Jesus so they will not have the time or energy or desire to argue about stuff that doesn't matter in eternity. So Paul knew what he was doing. And Paul goes on to tell them, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, rejoice in the Lord. Because Paul knew that when they're rejoicing, they can't be complaining. Paul knew that, right? We can't have cursing and blessing coming out of our mouth at the same time. So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And he says again, again, I'm telling you, again, rejoice. And it's not a suggestion, it's a command. And so, here we go. Paul says in verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to say, because he was a living example, he says, whatever things you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. All right, Paul was living what he was professing. 
I love that about Paul, that consistency. But he says, be anxious for nothing. And we touched on this last week, and I just want to bring it home one more time because we are living in anxious times. We are living in times of uncertainty. We don't know when this uh, shutdown is going to end. We don't know if the grocery stores are going to have enough food. We don't know, but we do know who we are in Christ, and we do know how big our God is. But he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. Okay, so be anxious for nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. That's just not the big things. That's the little things, right? And pray about everything, not just the big things, but the little things. Because it's usually those little foxes that spoil the vineyards. We can more easily pray about the big stuff. Walk in faith by the big stuff. It's the little stuff that goes through our mind all the time, unchecked, that will take us down, that will discourage us, that will depress us, and that will destroy our witness. So we have to learn to take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Or we will end up in despair and depression because that's what the word of God says. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. So when I start to feel depressed, when I start to go down, I have to stop and say, Kathy, what are you anxious about? What is troubling your soul right now? Because that is the source of my depression. And then I can apply Philippians 4, 6, 7, and 8 to that. So be anxious for nothing, pray about everything, and pray with thanksgiving. Don't forget that part. Super important to pray with thanksgiving. And you could always thank God for who he is. All right, you may not like your circumstances, may not feel good, doesn't matter, doesn't change who he is. And he is worthy of all praise all the time. So Paul says, be anxious for nothing. And then he says in verse eight, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, lovely, pure, of good report. If there's anything virtuous and anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. All right, so what is Paul saying? Paul's saying, don't think on the lies. Don't think on the um, everything bad. Just don't think about it. Just put it out of your mind and think on what is true. And I found this to be interesting first that in his list and how it kind of settled in my mind right now because there's a lot of fake news out there, right? And I just want to remind us that the only true news is the good news. That's where you settle. It's not on the right or the left. It's not this man or that man, this woman or that woman. It's in Jesus Christ. That's where your peace that passes understanding is found. Now, what I love about this is Paul's description, Paul's attributes, every one of them is embodied in the person in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the sum of all praise and all virtue. And all the righteous thoughts in Philippians 4, 8, every one of them are found in Jesus Christ. So when we set our minds on him, he will keep us in perfect peace. That's what Isaiah 26, 3 tells us. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, perfect peace, whose mind might is stayed on thee because he trusts in me. You know, where am I looking? What am I thinking about? What am I meditating on? All right, those are things that we have to ask ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal those areas of inconsistency. You know, there's a Psalm 139, 23, 24. Allow him to search us. Allow him to show us those anxieties. Show us those wicked ways and then lead us in the everlasting way. Lead us in those righteous ways. Teach us how to apply Philippians 4, 8 to these crazy little foxes that ruin the vineyard that go through our mind all the time. All right, let's be done with those. Let's be done. Yes? Okay, cool. All right. Paul had given them personal instruction here. And he says the things that you learned and received, heard and saw in me, these do, right? Not these, th not think about, not admire, not criticize. These do. And the God of peace will be with you. All right. And Paul was a living example of everything that he taught. And we should be too. Yes? Verse 10, Paul says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now, Paul was so grateful for their outpouring of love. But Paul was more concerned with uh, the spiritual fruit, the reward that would abound to their account. He was more concerned about 
them than he was with his need. And because Paul knew that when they gave to him materially, they would receive from the Lord spiritually. And that's what Paul wanted. Paul wanted them blessed. And Paul says in verse 11, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state to be content. <laughs> Ouch. Paul has learned. Okay, this is a process. So learning to be content in all things is a process, right? And if you think about some of the things that Paul went through to learn contentment, they don't sound that fun. In 2 Corinthians 11, 21 through 29, let me just read just some of the things that Paul writes that he has gone through, right? That God was faithful in and showed himself sufficient in. But Paul says, I'm going to read some of it out of the New Living for you. Paul says, I've been put in prison. I have been whipped times without number. I have faced death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders have given me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I mean, really, who gets shipwrecked three times? I don't know. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. I have worked hard and long, enduring many sleepless nights. I have been hungry and thirsty and have often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. God allowed Paul to be in all those predicaments. I think perhaps I would have been questioning God maybe the second time I was shipwrecked. Did I hear you? Am I going in the right direction? No, God allowed those things and he used them for good, for our good. God is still using those things that Paul went through for our good and edification as we read and study his word. That inspires me, it encourages me. And maybe someday I'll get to tell Paul how grateful I am that he was willing to enter into the fellowship of Jesus' sufferings so that we could have uh, the word of God in the New Testament. Now, Paul says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and be hungry, to abound and to suffer need. Okay, here we have it right here. Ready? This is Paul's secret to contentment. Jesus' sufficiency. You see, Paul had to learn to trust Jesus' providence. He had to learn how to trust Jesus' power. He had to learn how to trust Jesus' promises and experience the faithfulness and the all-sufficiency and the enoughness of Christ. See, it wasn't just head knowledge for him. No, he had to experience it. That's how he knew, is that knowing by experience. And that's the kind that he had. Learning contentment was a process for Paul. He says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Those were a lot of hard all things that I just read to you in 2 Corinthians 11. You know, what, hard, what hard things are you facing today? What, what, is, what is scary? What makes you anxious? Because right here, Jesus can do anything, right? He is the God of the impossible. He can, you, you can do all things through Christ, through resting in him, through his power, through trusting in him, through Christ, because that's where your strength comes from, in Christ. That's where your strength comes from. Think about, ask yourself, where am I getting my strength from today? Where do I draw strength from? Because if it's not in Christ, it's not sufficient, and it won't be enough, and it won't last. Find it in Christ. That's where your strength is. And Paul says in verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now, you Philippians, know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Paul says, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. 
Paul loves these. Paul was so others focused. He was so purposeful and, and intentional. And I love how he is just, he pours his life out for the church. I'm, I just, I just, uh, it just amazes me every time I read about Paul's heart. And, and back in 2 Corinthians 11, he, he lists that big long line about the shipwreck and the lashes and, and all these dangers. And then Paul, with his pastor's heart, says, and besides all these, besides all those things that he went through, Paul said, I have the daily concern of the burden for the churches. Paul was more concerned about the churches and their spiritual growth, their spiritual maturity, their protection, he was more concerned about the saints than what he had to physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually walk through. Amazing. Paul was a man after God's own heart too, just like Dave. All right. And so Paul says, Paul says, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What's your need today? What do you need? Do you need peace? Do you need provision? Do you need mercy and grace? God will supply all your need. A lot of times, I believe that we get our wants and our needs confused. It says, God will provide all my needs, not all my greeds. All right? Check that promise. But he also says, not only will he provide it, but he will provide it according to his riches in glory. Can you even wrap your mind around that? I can't. Sounds great. I love it. And I'm going to believe it. God will supply all your need according to his riches in glory. And how's he going to do that? By Jesus Christ. That's how he's going to meet your needs. And he says in verse 20, Now to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. Interesting, isn't it? And he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And I love how he opens his letter with grace and he closes it. The believer's life begins with grace and it's crowned with grace at the end. Grace. May the Lord bless you and fill you with his peace. Now, as we finish our study, as we finish our study, I want you to go back, read through these things, allow his word to continue to wash you. You have hidden a lot of these scriptures in your heart. Just allow the Spirit to continue to teach you and to reveal things to you and to demonstrate and to, to show you how much God loves you and to show you how big your God is. So let me just touch on a few things. A quick review over a few things that we, we covered just to kind of jog our memory. Back in chapter 1, we talked about Paul um, talking to his dearly beloved friends and thanking them for their fellowship in the gospel Paul was confident of this very thing, that he who had began a good work will complete it, and he'll do that for you too. Uh, Paul was talking about that their love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. Paul wanted them to approve the things that are excellent and be sincere until the day of Christ. Paul also talked about how everything that had happened to him, right? He was chained to a Roman guard. Everything that had happened to him was to further the gospel, and because of his chains, right, Caesar's household. And also, he said, because of my chains, most of the brethren became bold. When they saw Paul suffering and Paul still proclaiming the gospel and God blessing it, they got bold. And I love that. I pray that we can have that boldness today, that uh, be unashamed for the gospel. In chapter 2, uh, Paul talked and told them, about being like-minded, being of the same love, the same mind, of one accord. And he said, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Not of it. But with lowliness of mind, let each of you esteem others as better than himself. Right? And then, where is the greatest example ever? He says in verse 5, let the mind which is in Christ Jesus be in you. Because 
he was in the form of God. He did not consider it equality to be like God, but he, he um, gave, he, I think I need to start that over. <laughs> How does that start? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to God's glory. All right, that was the, ex that was the extreme the greatest example of humility. And Paul was holding that out to them as a reminder. In verse 3, Paul was warning them about the Gnostics coming into the church, the false doctrine, and talking also about uh, those things that were once gain was loss, and his citizenship was in heaven. And he loved that, and he told them, and he reminded them that. He told, talked to them about forgetting those things which are behind, letting the past stay in the past, and reaching forward, right, to the prize, right? That's Jesus Christ. So, friends, that takes us up to chapter 4, where we picked up today. Go back, be saturated in the Word. Like I said before, get into the Word. Get it into you. Let it dwell in you richly. God bless you. It's been such a wonderful time studying Philippians with you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.